Excellent. Well, thanks, everybody. Welcome to the SUT Late Lunch webinar for the 30th of November 2020. I suspect this will be, this probably is the last one for this calendar year. Uh, two weeks from now, it's our AGM, 14th of uh, December. So the slot that would normally be the webinar will be an online version of the AGM from two o'clock onwards, 1400 hours onwards, UK time. So uh, please register as you would for this webinar uh, through the SUT events webpage to turn up for the AGM. And uh, at that, you'll be able to see who our new fellows are. You'll be able to see who's uh, received other uh, awards and hopefully uh, get to meet our new CEO as well, if, if they're able to be there. So our guest today is Richard Mills. Uh, many of you will know Richard from his, his work over the years in, in various assorted places. And the subject we're gonna focus on is autonomous underwater vehicles, how autonomous do they need to be? So initially, over to you, Richard, just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and uh, we'll then enter into the conversation. Thanks, Steve, and thanks for uh, having me on. Thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in to, to listen. Hopefully, we can make it an interesting conversation over the next half an hour or so. So, yeah, I'm Richard. I work for Kongsberg Maritime, and I run the sales team for Marine Robotics globally. So, nominally based in Norway, but actually live in the UK. Um, and we are responsible for the promotion and sales of our portfolio of marine robotics, and that's unmanned surface vehicles and autonomous underwater vehicles for the commercial, the academic science, and also the defense industries. Um, I've been with Kongsberg now since mid-2012, so um, a little while, and prior to this, I worked for International Submarine Engineering, of course, on the west coast of Canada for a few years, doing a similar job, but with their Explorer range of AUVs. Um, I've been in the marine robotics industry for about 14 years now, and prior to that, I did something quite different indeed. I used to fly, uh, fly helicopters for the Royal Air Force and a couple of other people as well. Uh, so that's a bit about my background. Um, what I wanted to, to really have a conversation with today and really treat it as an interactive discussion um, is about autonomy and AUVs. Um, because depending on where we are in the world and depending on which industry we talk to, even the name of an AUV can change from AUV to UUV, for example, a manned underwater vehicle. And the interpretation of what they can do can change dramatically and how effective they are based on the level of autonomy they have. And the industry as a whole at the moment is really going through a transitional this transitional phase of how we make the vehicles more productive in mission whilst they run in a completely unsupervised way. Uh, uh, and my interest in autonomy really stems from uh, from prior to, to my career in, in marine robotics when I flew helicopters with duplex autopilots on them uh, and how they worked. But when it comes to using vehicles um, underwater vehicles, um, I mean, I joined a, a company, ISE, um, was my entry into this industry and was used to their customers putting those vehicles under the ice and letting them go for three days um, in high latitude environments, very difficult environments to navigate. So when I came across to Kongsberg and the Hugen, which, which is you know, quite clearly the most successful commercial AUV, I think, that's ever been built for the deep water environment, um, it was a surprise to me that the vast majority of operators then followed it around with a ship um, and they spent a lot of money and a lot of time supervising the vehicle. Now the, the Hugin AUV is exactly that, it is an autonomous underwater vehicle and it, it will follow a predetermined mission plan and that got me to thinking well what does autonomy actually mean uh, and what can it do for us in mission uh, uh, and how trustworthy is autonomy when you actually can't see the vehicle you don't necessarily know where it is out of sight out of mind it's quite easy to trust autonomy if it's in a you know a little lawnmower in your back garden it's not so easy to trust autonomy if it's a car and taking you for a drive down the street that will come over time i i imagine but then how how do we trust autonomy in something we can't see and uh, and we have no no way of monitoring it effectively so that, that's kind of my area of interest then steve mm, okay so you're quite right in that 
I quite often think of the Hugin vehicle as as a kind of almost an untethered but still remotely controlled vehicle, precisely because of what you just said. The, many of the early users of, of, of Hugin tended to treat it as if it wasn't entirely an autonomous system. So was there any particular reason why Kongsberg went down that pathway? Well, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of different reasons uh, of why the vehicles are used that way. And they still are to, to a certain extent in the commercial world, still, still run in a supervised mode. And with the Hugin OS, what we have, what we call the Hugin operating system on board the vehicle, you've got three modes of running the vehicle. So you've got fully autonomous, you've got the fully supervised mode, and then you've got a kind of halfway house in between a semi-autonomous or sparsely supervised mode. Um, fully autonomous, create a mission plan, load it to the vehicle, put the vehicle in the water, wave goodbye to it and pick it up when it's done. The vehicles do work like that and all of our defense clients actually run them like that and run them very well like that. Um, and then the, the fully supervised end of it, the vast majority of our commercial customers a few years ago, um, and still to this day, some of them still do, would put the vehicle in the water, but then supervise it with a, a HIPAC, the, the SSBL or USBL system. Um, because it gives three things back to the, the operator. So it gives telemetry. It tells you what the vehicle's doing, how much battery it's got, you know, what the payload sensors are doing, um, if there's any alarms, what stage of the mission plan it's on. Um, it also gives you a position update. And that was perhaps one of the most important elements um, because most of the commercial, deep water commercial survey requirements, they have a position accuracy requirement that's, that's calculated as a percentage of depth. And often it would be a very tight percentage. Um, and if we didn't supervise the vehicle during the descent, when the DVL doesn't have bottom lock, then the IMU drift, the navigation on board the system, on board the vehicle, would potentially drift so it would be outside of that performance. Uh, so the tendency then began to update it not only on the way down to its operating depth, but then once it, the DVL's got bottom lock on the seafloor, then to continue to update it periodically. Um, and then the third thing that you get back from the vehicle is you get a small amount of data back from the vehicle um, from either the side scan or the multi-beam. Uh, even if it's got a synthetic aperture sonar on board, it'll take the real side scan data and the multi-beam data, compress it, very small amount of it, compress it and send it topside. The reason we do that is so that you can see that the sensors are working, your settings are correct. It's not really designed to show you anything meaningful. You're not gonna see any detail in that data, but you'll get to see the area coverage. And say, for example, if you're looking for a 100 meter long shipwreck, you'll probably see that in the data, but not really any defined detail. Yeah. But as you say, one of the things you get from operating a vehicle like that is you can actually command it from the surface. So you can tell it to jump to another leg in the mission. You can tell it to jump to another line on the mission plan. You could turn sensors on and off. You can vary the settings on those sensors. You could even point it in a direction, give it a course and a speed to, to follow. And if the vehicle's got multiple mission plans loaded to it, you could even jump to a completely new mission plan. Um, so it does give a kind of acoustic remote control um, capability to the vehicle. What we've seen subsequently with the improvements in the nav system on, on the vehicle that have come on in leaps and bounds, genuinely leaps and bounds in the last couple of years, um, now we're seeing a transition as well in the commercial world. So a lot of our commercial operators are now trusting the vehicle a lot more than they used to. And I think one final point on the supervision side of it, um, I think it would be fair to say that these are not, um, they're, they're not inexpensive assets. There is, a, there is a significant investment associated with operating a, um, a survey grade AUV. Uh, and some of our customers were perhaps a little more comfortable knowing that they were following it around with an acoustic link. Um, for a, 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 an asset management perspective. Mm. So what's the usual ownership model for Hugins, uh, you know, Richard? Are, are most of your customers, are they actually buying Hugins off you or are they, they leasing or, or renting? You know, how does the system tend to work? So we, yeah, we sell systems. Generally, we'll sell something to a customer. Um, we tend not to lease because we're not a financial institute. Um, that was looked at a couple of years ago in Norway, actually, but the, uh, the financial regulation authorities, uh, their rules are a little, we'd, we'd effectively become a bank. So their rules are a little too stringent to operate then on a commercial basis, as we do. Um, 
we do have a system, a single system that we rent out, but rental's kind of the wrong word for it. Um, it's more a system as a service capability uh, where we provide the equipment and a couple of operators. That said, it's not priced to be a day-to-day -day solution. Um, our, you know, our, our, our whole thing is to deliver capability to people in, in selling systems. So we do the system as a service rental capability, either as a capability gap filler for an existing customer or a try before you buy kind of uh, concept uh, evaluation for potential new customers. Okay. Well, the, the question that, you know, we, we've attracted our audience in today is the one of how, how autonomous does an AUV need to be? So, you know, what are your initial thoughts and views on that? And have they changed as time has gone on? They have changed massively. Um, when I, when I joined the industry, I thought it was really cool to actually have a vehicle follow a mission plan. You know, this is 14 years ago or so, have a vehicle follow a mission plan and turn sensors on and off. And back, back then I thought, well, that's, that's pretty cool. That's autonomous. Um, but is it really autonomous? Um, it's a, a prescribed, a predetermined route with predetermined actions. Um, so simply getting a vehicle to follow a route and say, I'm at point X, I'll turn my sensor on and my sensors are set to this, and you predetermine that, and all I am is uh, following an if this, then that condition-based um, judgment. So if I meet this position, I turn that sensor on, I head on that direction. Is that really autonomous? Um, and then with the advent of things like the forward-looking sonar that we've got on, on the vehicle at the moment, um, we then have the ability to <laughs> react to our environment. Yeah. So we have the ability to react autonomously to the surroundings. Um, the the multi-beam we've got is a, it's a relatively um, inexpensive piece of kit that points forwards out of the vehicle. And instead of looking straight down in, in kind of that arrangement, it looks out the front in that arrangement. So you get 120 degrees up and down, you get seven and a half degrees either side of the vertical. Uh, and it'll see out to about a hundred meters or so. Uh, and we use that, originally we use that for pure collision avoidance. Don't bump into anything. Um, but actually, it's also more valuable now for what we call contour smoothing, trajectory planning, to keep the vehicle at a steady attitude over the seafloor, particularly important in, in undulous environments, particularly important for um, low altitude photographic missions as well. Using optical sensors, of course, we can't go too high off the seafloor. So staying nice and low to the seafloor, but keeping our, our attitude relatively smooth means we don't get smeary data we don't get blurs in the data and we don't get holidays in the data which is is very good so that's one way that we've in, implemented um, reactive autonomy but the vehicle still doesn't really change what it does it still follows a mission plan um, so we worked long and hard and a few years ago we demonstrated something we like to call adaptive autonomy um, where actually we collect information we collect data in a mission we process it, we run some algorithms on it, and then we react to it. We do something as a result of that. Now that for me is a, the first time that, that I've seen in a commercial environment, the implementation of, of um, I guess, true autonomy, adaptive autonomy, where the end goal is not necessarily defined at the start of the mission. Okay, no, that, that, that's quite interesting. And there's, there's um, I noticed Rowley's posted a, helpful question in the side which we could actually take now because it's relevant uh, rather than wait to the end where he asked does Richard feel that the Huguen AUV operations are constrained by the current legal framework you know as well and if it is being constrained any thoughts on how the law should be uh, modified yeah, so. so I guess what Rowley's getting at there is um, you know the, some of the laws as they apply to unmanned surface vehicles and maritime autonomous surface ships those types of things for AUVs there's not um, there's not a massive amount of constraint or restriction you know at the end of the day it's the ship's master who's responsible for the equipment when it leaves the vessel and when it comes back to the vessel um, but the equipment that we're talking about is all it's all relatively small in the ocean space, uh, you know, we're we're talking across the industry from micro UUVs that are, you know, 60 centimeters long and and 15 centimeter diameter and and weigh maybe you know five or six kilograms, up to 
you know, the traditional survey grade of AUVs that might be five or six meters long, maybe weigh somewhere in the region of 1200 to 1500 kilograms. Mm. I think at that level, there's not that many constraints. Um, there are obviously rules. Uh, you know, you can't take these vehicles within a 500 meter exclusion zone without approval of the rig master or things like that. The usual safety things that one would expect. Uh, but for general operations in the open ocean, it's less of an issue. Now, when you get up into the XL size of vehicles that we're seeing in the defense world that are now becoming a little more uh, visible, um, you know, in, in, when, you, when you get to that size of vehicle, the size of a double-decker bus or bigger, yeah. then yes, there are considerations and there are constraints and there is a requirement for collision avoidance on a proper scale there and the ability to have proper situational awareness. Um, I'm quite thankful that at the moment we don't play in that environment. So. Okay, so just to fill in for those of our viewers who, who are not super familiar with the Hugin range, can you describe what the different vehicles are? Because the Hugin isn't is certainly not one vehicle today, is he? It's, it's a family. No, it's not, yeah. So uh, we, we started off, or the Hugin program started off back in uh, May 1993 with its first dive. And it was back in those days simply called Hugin 1. And if you if you look around Google Hugin 1, you'll see this, this lovely Rankin style, low drag, mm -hmm. you know, elliptical hull, beautiful looking uh, piece of equipment. And it was designed to be uh, very much a low drag, high endurance vehicle um, on a research development partnership between Kongsberg, FFI, that's the Defense Research Establishment in Norway, and Statoil. Uh, Statoil obviously now being called Equinor. Uh, and it was designed as a, a multi-role platform, so it could be used for defense and for commercial applications. The challenge with having a, a hull shape like that is it's great, it's awesomely efficient, until you cut a hole in it to have a sensor on board. As soon as you cut a hole in it, then you're starting to impact the adverse drag, the form drag, far more than you are by having the beautiful smooth hull shape. So the vehicle shape then evolves rather rapidly. We introduced the first of the commercially available vehicles back in um, about 2000, and that was called Hugin 3000. Mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, this was where our, our naming structure was pretty obvious. So it was a Hugin 3000, um, and it was rated to 3000 meters. The next vehicle we built was called a Hugin 4500, and was rated to 4500 meters. Uh, and then back in 2007 or eight or so, we introduced something called a Hugin 1000, um, but it was rated to 3000 meters and it started confusing people. So um, when I came on board the company, what we did was have a look at the naming um, systems and we got rid of the numbers completely. So now we have this generic family of Hugin AUVs. And at one end, we've got what we effectively call a standard Hugin. So that's 3000 meter rated. It's about 24 to 30 hours endurance. It's about 5.2 meters long, give or take. And it weighs about 950 kilograms. And on there, you've got a full geophysical payload. So that's a synthetic aperture sonar that gives you imagery and bathymetry, a multi-beam echo sounder, sub-bottom profiler, camera and a laser, magnetometer and a turbidity sensor. That's kind of the stock standard vehicle. That fits in a 20 foot van and it comes with the launch and recovery system that's got a, uh, it's rated for C-State five and five meter freeboards. Um, and then you've also got a 10 foot van with the operator console in it. The van configuration is flexible. We can provide a single van that does everything and all, you know, so many options there. Uh, as required. So that's one end of the Hugin spectrum. We've then got a, a vehicle that's rated to 6,000 meters, but it's still a Hugin AUV, still a Hugin, standard Hugin AUV, but it's got more energy on board. And it's also a bit bigger because the foam density is different. So our vehicles aren't a single pressure hull. They're made of syntactic foam wrapped in some composite materials. Well, we've got some, some IP in the, in the stiffness, the rigidity, and also how it's mounted, how it's uh, laminated. Uh, and those vehicles rated to 6,000 meters have got a slightly different density foam, so you need more of it. They also carry twice the energy uh, because we thought if you're sending a vehicle down to 6,000 meters, you really want not just dive time, but you want productive survey time. So let's maximize the time it can spend at the bottom compared to the time it spends in the dive and the ascent. As a rule of thumb, you know, it's about 20 minutes per thousand meters on the way down. It's about 15 minutes per thousand meters on the way up. Um, 
So, you know, as a rule of thumb, you can take off somewhere between three and a half and four hours for a dive to 6,000 meters to get it down and get it back again. So we put twice the amount of energy on board. So these things will go um, somewhere in the region of about 50 hours. Now, it's not a linear increase. It's not double the, the, uh, double the, the endurance because the vehicles are a little bigger as a result of the foam. So you get that extra drag. Um, to give you an idea of size, they're 87 and a half centimeter diameter. They're about six meters long. They weigh somewhere in the region of about 1800 to 2000 kilograms, depending on the payload. Uh, and therefore they fit in a 30 foot or a 40 foot van. And there are still options then for a 10 foot or 20 foot operator, uh, operator van. The payload on those vehicles is pretty similar to the standard, uh, standard vehicle. But of course we've got a bit more real estate so we can put a bit more on. So as well as the SAS and the multi-beam and all of that stuff, we've got options then for things like uh, methane sensors and dissolved oxygen and some, uh, some pumped environmental water column sensors as well. And then at the top end of the tree, the, 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 the newest vehicle that we have so far is called Hugin Superior. And really what we wanted to do with that one is take the best that we can do and put it on a single platform. Um, so it's about the same size as the, the 6,000 meter rated standard Hugin. It's a tiny bit longer. It's about 20 centimeters longer, but it's not that much bigger. And the reason it's bigger is because it's got a sensor that's uniquely available for the Hugin Superior called HiSAS 1032 Joule RX Joule Receiver. And that sensor is, it effectively doubles the length of the receiver rays for the synthetic aperture sonar. So now instead of being able to see 280 or 300 meters either side of the vehicle, we can see up to 500 meters either side of the vehicle. So if we're traveling relatively slowly with the Huguenot AUV, you'll get a one kilometer swath for imagery and bathymetry in full synthetic aperture sonar resolution. Now on there, we've also, because it's, we wanted it to really be the best of the best of the best that we could do, we've put every capability that we could think of on the vehicle. So we've got terrain-based navigation. If you have known bathymetry of an area, then create a digital terrain map, digital terrain, terrain model, load it onto the vehicle, that becomes your navigation reference. So your accuracy is then predicated by the accuracy and the resolution of that DTM. We've got the ability to follow pipes. That's available on all, all of the other vehicles, but it's an option on the superior, it's, it's, uh, it's standard. So we can detect and follow pipes using the SAS or using the multi-beam. Uh, we've got what we call UTP, Underwater Transponder Protocol. We like, um, we like complicated names. What it really means is single beacon navigation. So it's a sparse LBL navigation capability on, on the vehicle. Um, but perhaps biggest of all, the biggest change of all is something we call micro navigation, where we take a percentage of the synthet synthetic aperture sonar returns and we feed that into the guidance system on board the vehicle. So all of our vehicles have got something called Sunstone which is our in-situ navigation processing. Uh, and that takes the IMU, takes the DVL, uh, the depth sensor, the compass, all of those things, and feeds them into our Kalman filtering, which is our Sunstone uh, package. So Sunstone is, is not only the algorithms and the software, but it's also the hardware it sits on. It's some unique, uh, unique boards that it sits on for efficiency. And what we've done with MicroNav is we feed that in then as, a, as an aid to navigation as well. Uh, and what it means in realistic terms is, well, the vast majority of AUV manufacturers will, will all quote you about the same capability. It'll all be somewhere around one tenth of one percent of distance traveled in a straight line on a flat bottom. Um, and what we've done on the standard Hugin is uh, through empirical evidence and statistical modeling, we've dropped that down to 0.08. Uh, on the Hugin Superior, on the spec, it's 0 0.04 because of micro navigation. Um, but actually, on a dive that we did on a customer delivery about three weeks ago now, we did a 52 hour mission in one of the fields on the west coast of Norway in 1,000 meter water depths, mowing the lawn for 52 hours, completely unaided. No supervision, no high path updates, utterly unaided. Um, and at the end of a 52 hour mission, uh, navigation error, error was better than, and I have to get the right number of digits here, 0.002% of wow. distance traveled. I mean, what it means in real terms is, is this is enabling autonomy now that, that you can put your vehicle in the water and forget about it and go off and generate revenue concurrently doing something else. Um, you know, in, in measured terms, what it means is in a, a 
a two-day mission previously, you'd expect somewhere around two to 250 meter, a long track, predominantly a long track position error. If you did nothing, if you did no aiding, no external updates, no terrain navigation, none of that. But after this 52 hour mission, our error budget was genuinely less than 10 meters. You know, that's a phenomenal game changer. So does the operator, you know, have the ability to uh, reconfigure, you know, the, the vehicle's level of autonomy? Uh, in that sense, I mean, do you do you simulate missions in advance before deployment, and then make a decision about the level of autonomy that you you require? You know, how, how does that that aspect work? A, a little bit. It depends on the mission. So, so we do have the ability to simulate missions and emulate mission plans, um, and also do navigation assessment pre-mission. There's a there's a thing built into our navigation processing capability um, where you can simulate an outcome so let's say for example you've got a box that you need to survey um, and you put the vehicle in and you say well i only want to give it an update once every three hours what will my position error be or conversely you can say i need to be better than this position error for a commercial survey how frequently do i have to update it so that's one of the tools that we have available to us that will advise and influence operators on what what they can and can't do with the vehicle when it comes to the the adaptive autonomy side of things it's a little bit different because that's at the moment that's only available for the defense world um, and, and that takes us into um, naval mine warfare with the detection classification and identification of mine-like objects in a single mission where previously um, you'd probably get away with saying, well, we can detect mine-like objects. You know, back in the 90s and early 2000s, you might say we could detect mine-like objects, but everything will be processed after the mission. In the, the early 2000s, you know, target recognition started to become available. Um, so then you could claim that you can detect and classify mine-like objects in mission. And the classification is done against a library of mine-like objects that are kept on board the vehicle. Uh, and then the third element that has been around actually now about seven or eight years is the ability to take those mine-like objects and feed them back into the guidance system for the vehicle then to go and photograph them. So you've got detection, classification and identification, which is great. But actually, how do you qualify it? How do you make sure that there's trust in the system? So our, our system has got a, a quantifiable, measurable um, performance metrics associated with actually the adaptive control part. So we measure uh, or we detect and classify mine-like objects and we measure what percentage confidence the algorithm then has that it actually is what it thinks it is um, based on the number of hits or misses it has against the library of objects it has. Uh, and the, the algorithm progressively gets better. So the more it sees, the more likely it is to have confidence that it's true or not. Um, so then we can put a threshold into the system saying, well, if you've got less than 85% confidence, discard them. If you've got more than 90%, feed them into the guidance, that kind of, uh, of metrics. And then the guidance system only takes the top X percentage, whether that's 10, 12, 15, whatever, um, creates a navigation route to head, go back and, and photograph them. And with the implementation of micro nav, that's really kind of the, the last block the last jigsaw bit if you know what i mean because now instead of going back to a target and having to do a cloverleaf figure of eight or a mow the lawn around each target to reacquire it now we can go straight back to it mm. with confidence that we're going to go straight over the top of it okay and uh, am i right in thinking that at the moment none of the hugin family can hover can they no that's that, that's right and it's something that <laughs> we get asked for so infrequently. And I don't know whether that's because people think, well, the Hugin can't hover, why would I ask for it? Or is it because there's little industry requirement for it? Obviously there is a requirement for that capability, otherwise vehicles like the Sabretooth wouldn't exist and the freedom from oceaneering and our, you know, the, the Elim project that we're involved with, these things wouldn't exist if a hovering capability wasn't required. But in the markets and, and places we operate with Hugin today, um, it's not something we get asked for particularly frequently. 
Okay. And what about the, the ability to hibernate or, you know, rest on the seabed until something interesting turns up? You know, is, is, is that, again, I suppose, particularly for a defence user, is that something of interest? I'm, yeah, we're not going to, yeah, what can I say here? We're not going to lay on the seafloor. Um, uh, um, but persistent capability is obviously of interest to an awful lot of people. Mm. Um, there are there are a multitude of ways of achieving persistence and this kind of crosses over both commercial and and the defense world i mean in the defense world there are obvious cases for having a persistent capability mm. in the commercial world can one achieve persistence through residency you know the elon vehicle is a subsea resident vehicle for I, imr um, and it lives in a garage on the sea floor uh, uh, and uh, and is capable of um, structure inspection, of uh, light emergency intervention, those types of things, much like the uh, the oceaneering freedom vehicle does, much yeah. like the saber tooth can. Yeah. Um, so it's that kind of environment, slightly different requirement, slightly different configuration of vehicle, slightly different capability. Um, it's really horses for courses. Um, but can you achieve it through that, or can you even have mobile persistence with systems operated from USVs, where there's still no people, but can stay at sea for, you know, weeks, months, mm -hmm. potentially. Yeah, the ability to surface, dock with the USV, recharge, yeah. uh, and then carry on the mission that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, in, interesting. Lots of ways to skin the cat, so, Indeed. so, so to speak. So, um, I mean, speaking for just over half an hour, is this a good point for me to open this up to the audience, if they'd like to ask you particular questions richard or are there areas you'd like to co cover before we no, go? let's go for it let's let's see what everybody um everybody wants to ask i'm intrigued actually this is one of my favorite bits is to find out what everybody wants to know excellent okay well again i'll, I'll just press the stop recording button so uh, for, for any of you that listen to this as a later podcast thanks very much for listening in uh, i have a, a policy of not recording q a because people tend to clam up and not ask questions if they think it's going to be uh, <laughs> recorded forever so I'll, I'll i'll stop the recording now and we can